All right, I think we're getting started uh, again. So I am Matt Moore. I'm a senior engineer uh, working over at Raleigh Healthcare right now. And they are predominantly a Scala shop. Um, my little sort of journey in history and functional programming uh, started with Clojure, of all places. Um, a friend of mine who's actually here tonight got me started in that. And then I moved on to type systems. Like, I want to learn everything there is to know about type systems. So I got into Haskell. Oh, boy, that was a journey. Um, but it was a good one, and I learned a lot of things. Um, so very similar background. I also worked in Ruby, uh, like Attila did. And uh, kind of we had a similar journey going through things, just discovering all this stuff. Um, so tonight we've talked about uh, monads, obviously. Attila's introduced a few of those. Um, I'm going to talk more about IO monad in particular, uh, which is, as it's named, all about IO operations. And I want to draw some distinctions between these different types of monads as well. Um, some of these lines get blurred what you use different monads for in, in Kotlin, and even in Scala for that matter. Uh, in Haskell, monads are, like the name of the monad is very strictly adhered to, and the compiler will actually make sure that you can't deviate from those behaviors. Uh, so we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit as well. Uh, the second part of my talk is gonna be about parallel processing with monads and how easy this can get. All right. So monads do a lot of things. The most common thing that we use them for in functional programming, of course, is happy versus bad path. Um, stuff goes right, great. Stuff goes wrong, oh no. How do we handle that? Um, I talked about how you have different types of monads. Uh, so Till already talks a lot about the top uh, two there. I threw state up here just to let you know it exists. I'm not gonna talk about state tonight. But in short, state is, at a high level, a way to explicitly represent state between different monad calls. Um, I.O., of course, is all about input-output. So the way to think of this is, if you have nulls, like Attila said, you've got option for that. Either is going to go and say, all right, I've got something missing or something went wrong. Go ahead and represent that, uh, those exceptions with either. And then I.O. gets more specific about input, output. Now in Haskell, I.O. has to be used for input and output. You can't you do input, output in either. You can wrap them, but you can't do direct input and output without I.O. Whereas Kotlin does let you do this. So I.O. monad is the ticket for any I.O. operations. All right, let's, let's uh, come up with a problem domain here that we're going to try to solve. So let's say we have these three pieces of data stored in different APIs. This is kind of similar to the type of problem that Attila had earlier. We've got customers, orders, and addresses. And these have fields associated with them, et cetera. So let's start with, I have an order number. And I am, let's say, a delivery driver. And I need to actually find the address for this customer that ordered this thing. But these are all stored in different services. So the sequence of getting that address, the sequence of operations here is go to the order service and look up that order number and get that data back. And you want to get that data back on the order so you can find the customer and then take the customer record and go find their mailing address and look that up. Now each one of these steps, you're getting an ID out of the fields that you then go look up the subsequent record, et cetera. Now, if any of these lookups fail, we want to return a simple message that says, not found. For whatever reason, maybe the order wasn't found. Maybe the customer address or customer record wasn't found. If any of those things fails, we don't have an address we can go find. And so there's no point in looking up an address for an order if any of those pieces of information is missing. So here's one way we can do this without monads. Is everybody able to see this fairly well? OK. I got a thumbs up from the back. Thank you. Um, so we have these functions here, right? Get order. Now, I'm not actually doing IO operations in this. I wanted to keep this very simple to just show the concept of how IO translates from error if you had an IO error or success cases. But we have these functions here, get order, get customer, and get address. And as I mentioned, they take in an integer of some, some value, and they return whatever the type of thing it is that you're looking for. So we have an order here return on the first one on line one. We've got on five customer, we've got the address function. And then finally, similar to what Attila showed, you have this function down here 
which is essentially an organizer, for anyone familiar with Ruby. I don't know if the term organizer was actually used a lot elsewhere, but I know it was very popular in Ruby. So this organizer essentially is like, I have all these functions that do things, and this is the sequence of operations that I want them to go in. So if we actually run these together right now and get address from order, any one of these could fail. You'll notice I have the, the double bang on the end of each of these dot find functions, because that's a nullable function. And I'm just saying like, go ahead and run it. If it doesn't find it, it's going to fail. I'm doing that for the purposes of showing just how easy this gets with IO monad. So if get address from order, any of these fails, you're going to have an exception thrown. You get a nasty compiler error like Attila had in his example. Um, so this is a very nice, pretty way to look at code, but it doesn't handle anything outside of happy path. What you could do is come in here and start adding try catches. You could do all kinds of uh, if statements to check on whether something was returned, whether it was nullable. You could even use the nullable thing on the end, the question mark that Kotlin has. There's any number of ways you could do this, but they're not easily composable. And we'll talk about composability. So let's go ahead and convert each of these functions that we had into an IO monad. The way we do this is You'll notice the return type of each function, order customer and address, after we've changed it over, is just that IO with order wrapped inside of it. And we just do that for all of them. You'll notice too, I'm not really changing anything else. I've just changed the return type and imported arrow.fx.io. Quick comment on FX. So Attila talked mostly about core. And I think you mentioned FX as well. There are actually four different libraries that 47 Degrees puts out right now for functional programming. The first one is core, as was covered. The second one is FX, and that's what I'm actually talking about right now. There is a third library that is called, uh, help me out here, optics. And we're not getting into optics. That should be another talk, actually, because optics are very useful. Optics essentially are a way to deal with immutable data structures that are very deeply nested without creating whole copies of those data structures over and over just to change like one field inside of it. Uh, and then the fourth library is meta, arrow meta. And if I have time, I'll go ahead and give a quick, yeah. There's MTL. There is MTL, thank you. I forgot about that. We were talking about this before, so. Um, so yes, there's technically five. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll talk about those, those other ones. But right now, I'm focusing on FX. So FX is all about how to get a lot of expressive uh, control for your IO operations in a very simple, easy to read way using IO monads, essentially what ArrowFX focuses on. All right, so we've changed these over to individual IO monads. And what we're saying here is that this, each function could fail or succeed, and IO monad is going to have some built-in behaviors around that that lets us handle that easy. Um, I had debated whether to take this slide down. <laughs> um, I wanted to quickly just call out that when we have these uh, types on the end of our, the actual return type we're specifying, like this returns an order, this returns a customer, obviously Kotlin has type inference, and that's great, you can use it. I tend to prefer not using type inference. I like to spell types out, and there's actually a reason for this. I've noticed if you are writing a function that returns some value inside of it, you could just call like IO and wrap that value in an IO monad, and you don't get compiler checks on what the result of that should actually be. Um, so I like to actually spell it out to say like it is IO of type order instead of just the IO block. Uh, Kotlin, Scala, and Haskell all let you do this without type inference. Um, anyway, personal preference. I like to use the type system. It helps me. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about monad composition, right? So that original example we had earlier, up there on the, on the left side, we're doing this get address from order organizer that can take each of these functions, call and return them. And as I said earlier, that could fail and blow up miserably. On the right side, you'll notice we're calling each of these functions after we've converted them, going back here. Yep, the back doesn't work. There we go. After we convert on the right there, everything over to an IO of type order customer and address. Went back too far. 
Uh, we can then on the end here say get address from function is a function that returns a final type of IO address. But inside of here, we're now composing these monads together with flat map. So I have get order that runs. If that succeeds, it will call that nested function with the order parameter. And it says, OK, go get my customer using the order.customer ID that was returned from that order. And so on and so forth until we finally get the address ID and return that. If, this, if every sequence in this succeeds, we'll actually get our address object back. Great. If any part of it fails, we won't. But we also won't get exceptions blowing up. which is what I just said on, for this slide. <laughs> so in terms of executing the monad, um, I think we talked about uh, unsafe run async, or unsafe run sync, sorry, to actually execute the monad. As Attila pointed out, IO monad is deferred. It doesn't actually execute when it encounters the, that, that part of the program until we actually call some kind of a uh, execution function on the end of it. In this case, I'm actually using suspended instead of uh, unsafe or yeah, unsafe run sync. It's even hard to remember and say. Um, suspended actually works uh, nicely with uh, Kotlin coroutines, I believe it is, and uh, ran into this actually after a conversation with Attila and uh, Simon Vergawen. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. One of the creators of Arrow. Um, but basically, when it actually encounters a dot suspended, it will execute the monad. It's almost like you're writing small mini programs inside your larger program that you can then go, then go execute. Um, but until you actually call that execution, it doesn't run. So in this case here, um, I'm passing in a negative one. You'll notice on the end of that monad, I'm saying dot handle error. This is if, if anything fails while executing this monad composition, this is what we're going to do is return this string address lookup failed. And so if it's found, great, it'll pass through, ignore handle error, and it'll print our address out. But if it, if it doesn't find the address, any of those fail, it goes ahead and, and tells us, here's the error message for that. OK, I'm going to talk about either again going back here, because you can actually convert an IO monad over to either. IO does not in and of itself, it has a concept of success or fail, but you can't directly out of the box, just use it to go get those things. So here, we can actually branch out our behavior conditionally. We can say dot attempt on the end of our monad. So get address from order is that monad composition we had with those three things we're doing. Attempt will run that. And then we do map. And inside of map, we're saying the return type that got handed to us, attempt is converting IO to either. Either dot left represents the error case. So we can do something with that. We can say this is the behavior that we need for this particular uh, failure. We use either.right to actually represent that success case. Um, don't want to go too much into either because Attila did an amazing job on that. But we can just sort of like use this as part of attempt with IOMonad as well. There are other ways that Arrow lets you handle this translation between these monads. Yes. When you convert an IO to an either, what is the type of left? What is the left type? Oh, so that would just be the IO failure gets mapped to left. If that makes sense. Oh, Wait, oh so. I only have one type, right? IO is, is one type, but it essentially does a success or failure return, basically. So with, with left, if I'm understanding, I think where you're going with this, left can actually hold different types inside of itself. In this case, either.left is going to have essentially nothing from IO. And it's saying like, OK, go ahead and, and not found. Although an IO could also return an exception as well. So you could, here I have a string, and I actually have an example of this later, where you'll notice on, on the right, either right, it.b represents the success value. There's actually an it.a that represents the error value. And if it is an exception that comes back from IO, then you can actually do it.a.message and get the error message from that, which is kind of cool. Um, did that kind of answer? Or? 
Kind of, yeah. Because okay. When you made the I.O., you only gave it it's a generic with only one type, right? Yes. So I wasn't sure, like, when you convert it to either, what that... Yeah, it's basically going to be nothing okay. in that case. Um, like, if it's just not found. If, if the thing that I.O. is running will throw an exception, then it would come through as an exception. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, either left could be many different types. Yes? Yes? Uh, is it always left reserved for errors and right reserved? Yes, by convention. By convention? Yeah. It's left errors. Yeah. And is it related in some way to Kotlin result class, which also has success value and exception? It may, it may be. It's a similar concept. Yeah. I don't know the underlying mechanics in terms of how close they are, but it's exactly the same concept. This is very similar to uh, in JavaScript as, as well, um, where you have, you can do like a, you know, some operation that can fail dot then uh, or dot error, right? You can chain those together. It's the same basic concept, so. Okay, why is this important? It's important because in this story of error handling in general, if you're not using monads, your program can essentially run amok, right? You as a programmer have to focus on, am I error handling correctly? And am I, do I have all the right if statements in place? Do I have all of the logging statements in place? Did I miss something? And if there is a function I missed and it does throw an exception for some reason, it's not caught and your program blows up. Or worse, some exception doesn't get handled correctly. The program proceeds assuming it did get the correct value, even though it's wrong, and you end up costing the company a billion dollars because some calculation was misrun. I have actually seen this happen before. <laughs> it was scary. I didn't do it, though. <laughs> so having IO monad gives us those safe guarantees, right? It's built into the monad. If you wrap something in monad, it has this concept inherently built in of success or failure. Left or right is another way to represent that. Um, there's actually a term for this. I promise I'm not going to go into mathematics, but there's a term called isomorphism. And it's basically what's going on here is the concept you mentioned, left, right for left error, right success, JavaScripts, then error, all those things are considered isomorphisms. They accomplish the same concept, um, just in different syntactical ways of representing it. But that concept does guarantee you more safety around your code. If everything gets wrapped in these, you know you can catch them and you can rely, especially in Kotlin with Arrow, you can rely on the compiler to tell you this is going to fail or not. So it, that is the value out of this. Essentially, as somebody phrased this to me once a couple years back, Matt, you don't trust programmers, you trust compilers. And I said, yes, <laughs> I don't trust myself either. So that's the value I see here for me personally. As I started doing more functional programming and started using these types, it was amazing to me how these, these issues you have with missed errors and exception just go away. I, I don't see them as much anymore in our code. So, all right, putting all these things together though, if we back up here, you'll notice we're starting to get this nesting thing going on. We're calling flat map the nesting and flat map. As you add more operations in, it starts to nest deeper and deeper which gets a little annoying. Um, there's a term for this in the Ruby community. I think they call it arrow style programming, where it just keeps forming an arrow as it goes on. Not to be confused with the name of this library called arrow. So we want to get away from that, right? We love the safety guarantees that gives us with a compiler, but we want to move away from that weird nesting that's going on. So there is a way to do this, and it is called monad compre, I'm sorry, yes, <laughs> monad comprehensions. I was going to say composition, so that's what we just talked about. So compositions are all about pairing monads together sequentially so they'll operate in a safe way. Comprehensions do the same thing, but they get rid of all the nesting. It's also going to give us a little more flexibility when we want to do parallel programming, which we'll talk about in a moment. So before we had this flat mapping going on here, on the right, You'll notice I've gone back to what originally looked like the imperative style of programming we had before that could possibly fail. I'm doing val order equals get order, passing in the ID, customer and address, etc. The difference is you'll notice on the return type for this function, we have io.fx, so we are wrapping this in a monad, and 
You'll note that's a little different for We have io.fx as opposed to just io. We'll get into that in a moment. You'll also notice we have the exclamation in front of get order, get customer, get address. This is actually a shortcut for a function, jumping ahead here, called bind. Uh, bind says inside this comp composition or comprehension, we're going to uh, take each of these functions, execute it in the context of the IO monad, and hold on to that value. You need to call bind on each of these things. Now, Simon Vergwen, who's one of the authors of this, uh, he had mentioned, and thanks again to Attila for pointing me in that direction. Um, rather than do dot bind, their preference is to go back to this uh, exclamation here in the beginning. So you exclamation dot get or exclamation get order. But it's the same thing as dot bind. It's essentially an alias for it. Okay, so what do we get with this different from the original imperative style? Because it looks very much the same. We get to write it the imperative style, line by line. If we want to add more operations onto this, we can just keep going next line and adding that in. But we also get monad guarantees in the compiler. Under the hood, this is running them the way we saw the flat maps nested. But we just get to use this nice syntax to do this with. And io.fx becomes necessary here because in order for Arrow in Kotlin to actually understand this is a comprehension, all of that logic is handled in the FX library. So you'll need that io.fx if you're going to do this stuff. Also, I'm importing arrow fxio and fx extensions.fx. The naming is a little weird, but that's what io.fx lives in. So you'll need that as well. OK, so we talked about that. So it's looking imperative, but we're getting those monad guarantees around error handling. So yeah, again, this is just a shortcut. You don't have to keep typing bind on everything. You can just stick that in the front. OK. So to actually run this, this, com this comprehension, which is, like get, is all about getting rid of that, that arrow nesting, you can do it the same way that you would do for regular composition. Call get address from order. In this case, we're passing in a negative one, which is not a valid number. And then call attempt on that to actually convert it to a either left, right, left arrow, or error, or right success. And then based on that, we can print out not found if we got the error, or it.b for the actual results, which would be an address type. Yes? Um, the get address from order, if I save that off to about, so I said about to equals get address from order, could I say who dot attempt multiple times and it would run it over and over? Yes, absolutely. It still delays it, but it will, yeah, it'll still run it. Um, yeah, you could you could assign it to as many things as you want. So, hey Matt. yes, sure. So, does this always print not found and address lookup failed together always? No, that's actually a good question. Yeah. I should get into that. So, yeah, I have this error case here, right? But I've also got this other handle error at the bottom. So yeah, what is up with that? Um, if one of the functions that I'm running does fail with like a normal, ex within the context of that function, a normal expected exception, then I would print not found. However, as I think Attila also touched on, there are some cases where the JVM being what it is, you might have some weird, bizarre, un unknown exception that could occur outside of those functions that's going on, but still within the context of the whole composition. If some unknown exception occurs that you're not thinking about in terms of when you're running I.O. happens, um, address lookup fails will then get invoked. Is it, is it a difference between like a, uh, let's go back to Java, exception versus a throwable? Yeah, basically. Um, so like out of memory error would be handled by handle error because it's a throwable. Yes, I believe so. Session. Yeah. It's a yeah. And so, so you always want to make sure you wrap what you're doing in handle error just to be on the safe side. Fair. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I I, sorry, I assume yeah. you also want to not just print address lookup fail, but knowing that you're out of memory too. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yes, that's the error I'm throwing up here. Um, but yes, this could be something like that, yeah. for example. Eventually, you want to see the stack. Yes, yes. Um, by the way, I'm just putting regular strings in here just to kind of like as a placeholder. You should totally not just put a string that says address lookup failed. That's bad on you if you're actually doing that as a coder. <laughs> so in, inside of the handle error lambda, the yeah. it is a throwable? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I thought I had an example of this up here, and I guess I don't. But yeah, the example I mentioned before, where like here we're doing print line not found, or even like in the handle error, you, you can do it uh, dot message on the bottom, or like it dot b dot message up there in the left. Um, so, and then get that underlying exception message that came through. Don't you get a throwable as well in the next? The uh, throwable, I think, would be handle by handle error. But I don't recall specifically how that gets categorized. It'll get caught by one of them. I do remember that much. Um, interesting question. Hit me up afterwards and we can actually check this out. I think that's quite tight and the systematic. Yeah, yeah. That's a back to the left. Yeah, to totally makes sense. I would just need to like double check in my head to make sure I'm right on that. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, by the way, all this code is on GitHub as well. My GitHub, you can go check that out. I'll put it out in the Chicago Ling Slack as well. Until you should probably do that too. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that? There's a lot there. Okay. Let's talk about parallel processing with monads. This is where stuff gets, in my opinion, really, really neat. Um, as somebody who's actually had to deal with building thread pools in C++ code many years ago, I'm not a fan of that. Um, this is much easier. All right, so the problem we're gonna talk about here, sort of my story of, that I came up with for this, is let's say you got a text document. This could be anything at all. I mean, it could be a binary file, or whatever. I just came up with a text document here that I've got split up into multiple parts on different servers, different hard drives, different files, wherever. They're coming from all kinds of different places. And I have a list of those files somewhere. It's literally just gonna be a, a, a Kotlin list. And I wanna actually go grab those contents that are split up and join them together into a final output, right? So, with what we've learned so far, on the right, we have here a function called get file content. Now I'm putting a thread.sleep in here to simulate the fact that this operation takes time to do. Reading a text file on my local hard drive is not very long, <laughs> so. But imagine this were some IO operation going out to a network call somewhere. Um, so we'll simulate and we'll say it takes about two seconds for that to happen. And then we go ahead and read the text on that file and return it. Down in combined files, we take a list of files, which you can see further down, we have a file list equals list of, and we've got parts one, two, three, and four stored in the data folder. Cool, cool. So we go up here, we pass in that file list to combined files. We call get file contents, which reads that file, passing in the index in the list. A number of different ways you could store this and address it, not particularly important. The idea here is we have these four files and you'll notice we're using our io.fx again. So this is a monad comprehension. So we don't have to deal with the flat uh, mapping, the nesting and the flat mapping we saw before. And we call get file content for each of those files and at the end, we return parts one, two, three, and four, all joined together. Great. You could do concant and all that, but plus is just visually easier. So you return the whole thing and we're done, right? We can go down here to combine files. It's a monad, we have guarantees. We're reading all the contents and down here we have combined files. But again, this is running sequentially, right? So this is kind of our original program before we've parallelized it, but we are using monads. Oh, that's actually where that example was. It.a.message, if anyone sees it at the bottom, where it's either left, so that's where we can get that underlying exception. Okay, so to parallelize this, we can use par map n. That's a weird looking function name. <laughs> I, I think probably. Um, I believe this is what it's called in Haskell or something similar, uh, which is where this came from. But 
You laughed like you, you know that that would be the case with Haskell. <laughs> so what we're doing here is we're saying, all right, combine files. We're going we're gonna to return and uh, we're going to call this io.dispatchers.default. Uh, it's going to, to coroutines, I believe. And we're calling this parmapn. And what parmapn does, it takes a list of arguments, um, which is a variable list. It, I think there might be a limit as to how many arguments you can pass eventually, but it goes pretty high. You can pass in a lot of different jobs to this. So you, you pass all these in as parameters, and then it will execute them in parallel, which is kind of cool. And then you get this lambda on the end that says, when you finish processing this in parallel, uh, go ahead and return the results to me with a lambda that, ma that matches the same number of parameters that I passed in to run in parallel. So you get this A, B, C, D. And just as I was doing before, I'm just going to add those parts together and return them. So this is how we run stuff in parallel. Great. Except that was with four files. What if I have 200 files or 3,000? Got a lot of typing to do. Yes. <laughs> Got a lot of typing to do. Or we switch over to part traverse. I skipped that slide because I had already read this stuff, right? This is basically what I said. We, we want to do this a little differently, so I don't have to keep typing. The whole point of programming is to get rid of the need for humans to do the same thing over and over and over again. So let's not do that in our code, right? Um, let's actually switch over to getting rid of that human, unnecessary human process. All right. So we change combined files to an io.fx, as before. But what we do here is we say our contents are going to equal files.partraverse. It's just that list we passed in. That list could be dynamic, could be stored somewhere, whatever, doesn't matter. It's some iterable, and we can call this part traverse on it, and then run that get file content on that particular uh, file that's in that list. And I don't have to do a lot of typing. It's very nice and short. Yes? Where is that part traverse extension method in IOFX? Uh, it is, I believe, in IOFX. I have to double check on the, I didn't put the import up here, and I apologize for that. Um, but again, I can, are you on the Chicago uh, Slack? Okay, uh, meet me afterwards and I can show you where the GitHub repo for this is. Because um, all the imports and stuff. By the way, a note about imports, and I think why I didn't put them on some of these slides. The imports in the current 0.10.4, I believe, version of Arrow uh, FX are a little crazy. There's like a lot of them. And the naming on a lot of them is just a little bizarre. It's like it's it's hard to remember. So you definitely need to like, okay, I've done the research to figure out what these all import from, and and uh, like keep that. Which is why I commit so much code to my personal GitHub as a sort of notepad of here's all these imports I need. So it's like a lot of imports for a very short amount of code. <laughs> but this is beautiful. We now have fully parallelized code running in in just what is this? Six lines of code, I mean, is it even really six? Technically, it could shorten down. I don't actually even need val contents. I could literally just run files.partraverse and then return the get file content. I could get rid of that variable assignment or value assignment. I just wanted to show that you could do a value assignment as well. Yes? Does, um, can you choose which execution context? Yes, yes. Though I will warn you, um, trying to figure out how to fit partraverse into different ones is a little odd. So is it by default on the default dispatchers? Is that? Oh, 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 yes. I, I, think, I think so. Um, yeah, because I just realized I had this up here spelled out. Um, I think you could do, I think you can specify a different context, but I don't recall how to do that um, for Partraverse specifically. I'm almost certain the answer is yes, though. And I think by default, it does just use default dispatchers. Um, good question. OK, so we've run this. Cool, we've got our dynamic list. Just to kind of compare what we had before, got that having to hand type all this stuff out, or our nice little parallel uh, operation here. And of course, up here, this was the sequential one, right? This is not running the par map n. 
Um, but this is like the final thing of what you probably want to do. Now, is there a, a good use case for ParMapN versus Partraverse? There is. So Partraverse is great when you have like a dynamic list of things like content or something you need to do. ParMapN is better if you have a specific sequence of operations you need to perform. So for example, if I were spinning up a web app in like a Docker container or something, as part of that boot up process, the application needs to go read config files from like four different sources. Then it needs to make some kind of call to an alerting system to let it know it came up. Perhaps you have some health checks that need to run. There's a number of different things, but they're specific concrete things, right? It's not a, a changing list over time. That you would use parmap n. And the reason for that is that you could just easily specify as each parameter, do this, then do this, then do that, you know, fire these things off. These are all things I specifically know I need to do. You could also represent that in Partraverse, but you'd have to like create a list, some iterable container, and then write your functions in there. It's easier to just do parmap n and just write the specific function that needs to go fire off. So in general, if you have a concrete list of actual actions or operations you know you need to perform in parallel that doesn't like change in a dynamic way, use parmap n. But if you do have a dynamic list of things that changes in terms of the contents over time, then you would want to use Partraverse. OK, how do we call these things? Uh, the same way we did with anything else so far we've seen in monads. Here's your monad combined files. Pass in the file list that we had. Call dot attempt, which converts it to an either, left or right. And then we have our handle error here just to make sure we've caught all exceptions that could possibly happen. And then we finally call dot suspended which will let this thing execute in the global context of any other suspend function that we have running. You could also change suspended with what until I had the unsafe run sync as well. There's also an unsafe run async, but we're not going to get into that. That's, that's too much right now. So uh, we call this, yeah, same way as we call any other monad. I want to draw your attention to something here. And this is one of the things I find powerful about functional programming in general, monads in particular is this idea that no matter what I'm doing, I'm doing parallel processing, I'm doing sequential processing, I'm doing parallel with this parmap and par traverse, whatever it is, they all follow the same contract. It's the same concept of I do a thing that can succeed or fail, and then based on that, I have a way to format using the type system. This is the error message, this is the success value. And that's kind of cool, because you sort of like know what to expect. By the way, this concept is in Scala. It's in Haskell. These concepts originated in Haskell. And like whether you go from Haskell to Scala to Kotlin with Arrow, you see those same concepts done exactly the same way. And they have the same guarantees, which is really, really cool. For me, at the end of the day, that is one of the, I think probably the neatest thing that excites me is that we have these nice abstractions that work the same way, regardless of the language you're in, or anything else. It's, this is just, these types work well anywhere you go. OK, so let's say one of the files failed to, attempt, to load, uh, the second file. First file will load, great. Second file fails to load. If it fails to load, the whole thing halts execution. And it's going to go to print, like if the file was not found. You'll notice here I switched over this it.a.message. If you actually run this, which I think I have, yes, here we go. If part three is missing, we actually get the exception that prints out in, in text format. Data, part three, no such file or directory. If it's not three, if it's two, it'll do the same thing. That is all handled by this either.left. So it knows, based on the result from par traverse or par map n, which of the things actually failed. And if it failed, halt execution. There's other ways you can control that behavior by customizing monads, but again, that's not gonna happen tonight. I should do maybe a follow-up talk on that. There's a lot of things you can do with monads, by the way. Error handling is not the only one. Okay. Oh yeah, and we talked about algebraic data types earlier. If there's one thing I wanna leave you with about monads tonight, because there's sort of this joke that once you understand monads, you can't, you can't explain them to anyone else. I'm gonna, oversimplify this a little bit, and I'm going to say that uh, whoever ends up watching this talk from tonight, 
That's a hardcore category theory uh, specialist, which is where this stuff came from in mathematics. Probably will like yell at me and insult me, and that's okay. I can, I can get down with that. But in a nutshell, I would say a monad is a way to take some input, do some process with that input, and you don't know what the result is going to be. But you know that it's any one of a number of possible way, categories, right? It could succeed or fail. It could be that the input and the process that happens to that input returns a string versus an integer. In a nutshell, a monad is a way to take some input into a function and map the possible output of that function, all the possible things that could happen with it, to types. That's what a monad is. It's some class, it's a functor, which is the basis for a monad. And again, I won't get into the details of the differences there, but it is essentially a class that can hold some value, and you don't know what that value is yet, but you know what it could possibly be. And then you map when it actually runs whatever the output type is to what actually occurred. When we talk about context with monads, monad context, that's exactly what we mean. The context means what's the thing that actually happened and what was the actual final result? It could be an IO operation, whatever, right? It's not something that we can specifically say for sure is actually happening in memory. We don't know yet, but it is going to be one of these possible things, success or failure. We know that something either goes right or it goes wrong. So it's all about just mapping inputs, processes to types that come out of that. That's what our monad machine does. And so algebraic data types are really just a way to model that. When we say either left or right, either is the overall encompassing data class in Kotlin, and either left or right are like the subclasses. That, that is part of it. It's a sealed class, basically. And you just say the sealed class is either and left or right are the possible components that exist under that. You can extend that however much you want, again, depending on what monad you're using. The end. Any questions? Yes? Um, so I got a little confused. What's the difference between uh, attempted and suspended? Ah, attempted doesn't actually run the monad. Because remember, this is a sort of like a program sitting in memory, but it's delayed. It hasn't actually executed. So attempted says, when this thing does finally execute, I want you to convert the success or failure that's inherent to, to IO over to the equivalent left or right, um, is basically what that does. Now, suspended is basically the execution function. It says, all right, you're actually running this as part of a suspend function. Go ahead and, and whenever it's ready to, go execute the code. So that's essentially what it's suspended. It's like thing is like the it's like a run statement, if you will. Like go actually do this thing that I've constructed. Yeah. This is about the either monad. So all the examples that we've seen and we come and talk about are like either data or error, but the type interface for it is more general. So are there other common use cases for like left and right? Yes. And again, I want to make sure you don't, like, I don't want anyone to be too hung up on the idea of left or right having to be left or right necessarily for it to be a monad. That, again, that's just like sort of the, those are sort of the conventions that have, that have come up with this. But yeah, it could be anything. And the values that they have inside of them could be anything as well. Um, you can, by the way, make your own monads, which is kind of cool. But in order to do that, you kind of have to understand how monads work more internally and how they map between types. Um, there are these things called the three monad laws, and I won't get into those. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's more than anything just convention. But yeah, those are, those are more generic. Like, OK, for example, we treated by convention left as error, right as success. I can literally flip those around. I can do left success, right fail. And actually, it will let me do that, I believe. Yes, because I can pass anything back as part of that return type. Because left could have an exception stored in it as the value, or it could just be a string. So I, I can totally change that. Um, but don't do that. <laughs> because any other programmer is coming along who knows what either left or right is, is expecting that convention. And if you really want to mess with a functional programmer, flip those contexts. <laughs>
Like, I don't understand. This should work. It did work. Why am I getting an error? Right. Yeah. So are the cases where you would, you know, we've seen the evolution of either to biomonad, but are there cases where you wouldn't use the IO monad, where you would just use either? Good question. Um, is it this just that it's not doing IO, or is there something more? So, I may have mentioned earlier how Haskell differentiates between, for example, IO, success or fail, and either left or right. Um, in Haskell, you simply cannot perform an IO operation in anything but IO. Like if you try to do this in, left, in either left or right, I believe it would fail. Keep me honest, Attila, but I believe that fails. Okay, he's thumb, thumbs up on that. So the reason behind that, now that is not true, by the way, of Kotlin with Arrow. Kotlin lets you mix the monads in different ways. Yeah, I can do IO inside of either left or right. And I don't know that, I don't know that the Kotlin Arrow community has a strong uh, rule set, if you will, or guideline around this. Yes? So I did talk to uh, Simon, who is one of the co-authors of One Arrow about two, three weeks ago via Zoom call. <clears throat> and, then, and then I asked him about this purity question, like can, how can I make sure that my program is yeah. pure, my own pure? And then he said that with Arrow Meta, they will be able to write the interceptor, but they will be able to validate that your program is IO pure or not. Nice. I agree. Yeah, in Arometa in general, I, I don't think we mentioned that much, but yes, things like this, it's like Arometa is all about trying to make these functional concepts from Haskell and to some degree Scala more pure and actually enforceable within your functional code base in Kotlin. That is what they're trying to do, yeah, with, with Arometa. I didn't know they were doing that specific thing. That, that's really cool. So, yeah. Yeah, I just want to add that there is a talk by Amanda on Kotlin Conf about the, how Arrow Meta would be like, enhancing the IntelliJ to like, highlight your functions and do all kinds of cool things. Yeah, definitely go check that out. Yeah, there's some good info there. Um, did I answer your question? Or who was, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have another question. So, uh, how does Arrow uh, relate to our, uh, reactive streams? Because some of the concepts are similar, and I wonder if there is some sort of adapters between the two. Because a lot of people already have Rx Java pipelines in place, and want to try to migrate parts to our Arrow. Like, is there some sort of as either or like converters or something? So I will say, unfortunately, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if Attila has any thoughts. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, Arrow does have the async mode yes. that allows you, kind of generalizes any kind of asynchronous operation. <coughs> and the um, Arrow FX does have a reactor, or like all these different reactor mm -hmm. frameworks has wrappers around oh. them. And so if you use like Rx Java, you could use, yes. you could use a wrapper that would allow you Added to your cool. Thanks. I didn't know that. That's that's nice. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so I guess I don't know the answer. Um, is Arrow only on the JVM or is it multi-platform? <sighs> <laughs> I sigh because I love native. No. Yeah. It's it's all JVM. That being said. Um, it was a few months ago I was looking into, when I was looking into this, because I'm like, yeah, I can have this for native, no. Um, there is a branch that, I think his name is Paco, Paco Estevez, or, yeah. I always forget his username versus his real name, I'm sorry. Um, but he, he was uh, talking, there were some comments in there about how they had tried getting it to work with native. The last I saw on that was, and again, this was like two or three months ago maybe, the last I saw on that was, Work in progress, a lot of stuff done, still not quite working. So I really hope that comes soon. Are you a native fan? Or multi-platform in general? I have something that carries it with me more. Okay, same here, same here. Um, I, I think there's a lot of exciting things we could 
do with native. But I also know in general, native and multi-platform are kind of, there are a lot of pain points there in, in the community. So I think they'll get, they'll get resolved over time, uh, especially as popular as Kotlin is becoming. So but yeah, that was, that was definitely a big reason why I couldn't go with native for certain projects. So. Any other questions? Okay. I guess that about wraps it up. Just got a little self-plug here. If you want to learn more about this stuff, go check, check my things out. Thank you. Also, quick note, this recording tonight is both being recorded by Spy Hero, thank you guys, as well as being recorded by my podcast. So we have a new podcast I'm starting with Dave Clausen over here is my co-host. It is called the Lambda Show. The web address is literally lambda.show. Who knew that domain was available? Um, <laughs> it was awesome. I was like so excited. So uh, anyway, we're doing a combination of things. It's very heavily focused around functional programming in general. We're not just covering Kotlin. We're doing Kotlin, JVM, native, functional programming. And actually, we may have an episode on that in the future for the native question. Um, we're also doing interviews of people across different uh, companies in general with tech. So not strictly engineering, though very heavy on the engineering side. Um, right now we're focusing on functional programming as well as like community efforts and what companies are doing for things like Agile. We have an episode on Agile's coming out and how so many companies get this wrong. Um, dear friend of mine who's an Agile coach um, has some really good info on that and uh, Dave was in on that as well. Um, thank you, Dave. That, that episode turned out beautifully. Those are going to be releasing over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, definitely check that out. And uh, we will hopefully uh, soon this year uh, also have Raul Raja, CTO at 47 Degrees, on our podcast, hopefully, as well as Simon Verguin and Paco Estevez. Um, there's a few others, so they've agreed to come on there. So should have some very interesting conversations, and I will be sure to get in that question about when are you guys going to have this done? <laughs> and do they need any help? So uh, yeah, so definitely check that out. Also on Kotlin Link Slack, I have created a new channel recently based on some conversations around functional or un a practical understanding of functional programming. So go check that out, Practical Functional Programming. Pretty straightforward title. Um, there's, I don't know, about 15 or 20 of us in there so far. And we're all waiting to have the conversation about this. We just got started this week. Um, but yeah, so let the conversation continue. All right. That's all I got for you guys tonight.